what I'm talking about. Wait. Okay, now, from the beginning. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> uh, hi. Welcome to Building an AR Core App, Learnings and Challenges. Just to get a sense of everyone's experience of AR Core, who has just started developing with AR Core in the last month or two or is looking to start? Looking. Oh, wow. Awesome. Awesome. Um, anyone else beyond that with a like, few months of experience? Cool, cool, great, um, awesome. So today's talk is not going to be about what is an AR core. Um, instead, we are going to focus on some areas to consider when building AR core apps and possible ways to address them. Um, the idea is you can go through tutorials on your own, but this is kind of like some real life information that is more difficult to find uh, with a Google search. So um, a bit about myself. I am a software engineer at Google, and I work on AR Core initiatives. Um, before this, I was the team lead for the Google VR and Tango Unity SDKs and engine integrations. Uh, I also worked on cardboard camera, Android, and iOS, and I competed at the Olympics in figure skating. Slightly unrelated note. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in my current work, Building AR Core apps on Unity is a very large part of my work. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk about some challenges and learnings uh, from a, almost a year of prototyping with AR Core. Um, today, we're going to start off with an overview of AR Core concepts, and then we'll dive straight into the key issues. Um, this has to do with surface detection, planes, AR interactions, 2D UI, and most importantly, performance. OK, so for, so for our overview, let's, uh, this is a screenshot from the AR Stickers app. Uh, it demonstrates motion tracking. So with motion tracking, what this means is that your phone knows where it is in the world, like position and rotation. You can do a lot of really interesting things with this, like object interactions based on distance. So for these little guys, when you walk closer, they will interact differently, they'll animate differently. Um, and what's even better is the more you track, the more better understanding your phone gains of the world. So this brings us to anchors. Anchors are like poses, except that poses are temporal and they don't last forever. Anchors is basic, it's literally anchoring a virtual object to a place in the world. So what this means is as AR Core gets a better understanding of the world, your anchor updates with it. Uh, for one example is, let's say when you start up AR Core, it thinks the floor is about five centimeters higher than it should be. If you place an anchor on the floor, uh, over time, that will also go down five centimeters as AR Core understands that the floor is actually five centimeters lower than where it initially thought it was. So that is what Anchors does. And planes. So AR Core understands horizontal planes. This is anything from a table to a floor. Uh, and it knows like the boundary of the floor it detects so with x like um, horizontal x and z uh, extents. Planes can merge with others. So this means if you detect a portion of the floor and then a separate portion over time, uh, as it detects more and more of the floor, these will all merge into one. And we'll come back to this uh, later on uh, why this is really important. It's important to note that. AR core is good at tracking textured surfaces. Much like the human eye, these are features or um, easy identifiable things that you can pick out at a distance. So things like white walls or glossy surfaces, um, AR core will have a hard time identifying those the same way that your eye would have a difficulty picking out a point on a white wall. And Next is also lighting estimation. AR Core can detect the lighting information of an environment, and it gives back a value that represents the average intensity of the ambient light. 
This lets you render your objects with really realistic lighting. So in this example, we uh, have used Unity lighting, lighting estimation aware shaders. So it takes that average intensity value and multiplies the color by that value. So when the room darkens, the lion also darkens. It also uh, lets us detect when that average value changes so we can have lighting aware interactions like this scaredy lion. And finally, uh, uh, we have points in AR Core. This is, uh, we call them a point cloud. These are features that, again, your, that your eye can pick out at a distance. There are normal points and what we call oriented points. When there is a cluster of points together, we can estimate the normal that's perpendicular to the surface. This allows us to place objects on surfaces at an arbitrary slope. So not exactly a, a non-horizontal plane, but close enough. OK, let's dive right into learnings and challenges. I want to note that the answers I'm going to cover are not the only true way to do things. As you'll see, there's no one-size-fits-all solution, and it often depends on your use case and what you're trying to do. Surface detection. So when we talked about planes, um, we, did, we did cover that when air core starts up, it needs some time to find the floor or find a, a horizontal surface. Um, some challenges this presents is that your users are new to AR. They may not know that surfaces need to be detected or that you need to detect a surface first before placing objects. They may not trust the scale or placement of objects. So one approach we can take is tutorials. For example, in the AR Stickers app, they show a tutorial uh, that's basically a phone moving in a circle. They show it just once, and uh, it goes away. It's very minimal, but it tells us how to find a surface and why it's important. Um, so this is the onboarding when the user needs it approach, because in studies, we've discovered that users don't read tutorials much like the rest of us. Um, detection takes some time. So while this is going on, how do you make it look good? Do you allow initial object placement without a floor? What about when you lose tracking? Or what about when you lose planes? So to address each of those in order, one option is to, yes, allow initially placing objects even when you haven't detected a plane. This is the approach that AR Stickers uses. Uh, and when a floor is detected, so they've set some arbitrary floor height below um, your eye level. And then when you actually do find a floor, it anchors the object right to the floor. When you lose tracking, what you can do is, so one possible approach to taking care of loss of tracking is have, like know where your floor values are while tracking is running. Keep the fake floor so that when tracking goes away, your objects are still on the fake plane. Your objects do not necessarily need to be anchored to the real plane so that you have the optimal user experience even when tracking uh, goes wrong for some reason. And here, so this is a, a screenshot from the tabletop app. This was a launch app for AirCore developer preview 1.0. Uh, we had it as a press demo, and I was uh, part of the two-person team that worked on this. We decided to go with um, spinning dots and this kind of a plane visualizer to show people that a surface was being detected, uh, and we decided not to allow placement before, um, before a plane was detected. Uh, this is just a choice, so we had a very different uh, decision and approach than AR stickers. So, uh, so again, this is one of those it depends uh, approaches. And yeah, visual indicators, which we uh, we talked about. So one uh, one pitfall with showing tutorials is if you may not want to show it all the time, you may bore the user, but you also want them to realize that. Um, plane detection is important. So when placing objects, 
what you can do is show the part of the plane that's right underneath the objects. Um, what we chose to do in this app was show the plane whenever they're scanning the surface. What AR stickers chose to do was not show the plane at all and just let people place. So this results in a few different um, user experiences. For one, the user may not be aware that planes are there, but may that maybe that's what you're going for. Or maybe you want something super robust and you're thinking from a debugging perspective where I always want to know where my planes are. Uh, so it depends on user education and play, te play testing to know what your users expect. So to summarize our learnings, we have to, we want tutorial visuals for movement and optimal areas to scan so that they know not to scan glossy surfaces or white walls. Um, you may consider starting with a default floor plane and potentially having loading indicators like a spinning circle uh, or some kind of a loading polygon. And this takes us uh, to planes. So AR Core provides us with what they call trackables. These can be points or planes. And when you get uh, all the trackables for a session, they really mean all of the trackables. So this resulted in some challenges. All trackables, remember when we talked about how some planes can be subsumed or merged with others? Well, the little plane fragments then have, they have this flag that's called subsumed by, and it becomes non-null when they are subsumed. But they are also returned in the list of trackables that AR Core gives you. So what you want to do is filter out for the good and the valid planes. There, we found that there are three key uh, things to check for, which is subsumed by is not null, mesh verted, well, subsumed by is null. Subsumed by being null means that it's, it's never been taken over by another plane. And that it has its boundary vertex, has a vertex count that is not zero, and its x and z extents are not zero. We'd learned the hard way that if you are visualizing planes, you might be visualizing invalid planes. This can result in things like a plane floating in midair for some reason. Uh, and it took us uh, a while to figure out that we can't just take all the planes that AirCore gives us and use it blindly. Having multiple planes. So this results in you might think, yeah, of course I want all the planes. Of course I want the table and the floor and I want to place objects everywhere. One complication of that is dragging an object between planes. So if you drag an object from the table to the floor, do you just have it jump sharply? Do you have it fall from the table to the floor? What about if you go the opposite way? What looks good? What does the user expect? It may not, you may not want users to drag things between floors and tables all the time. Imagine if you had an art installation and you had a huge um, AR sculpture. You wouldn't want a user to drag that from the floor to a table where it would be way too big and um, probably not the appropriate context for appreciation. So it depends on your use case and uh, it depends on if you have the resources, like the developer resources, to invest into making that interaction work. What we chose to do for tabletop was to allow only placing on a single plane. So we went with the lowest plane we detected and uh, we stopped it at that. This simplified a lot of things and we were able to ship a quality app in a short amount of time. Parallax effects. So in this video, notice that the burger originally appears to be on the tree stump, but it is actually placed on the floor behind. This is, uh, so one way to mitigate this is to put uh, contextual visual indicators. For example, the feet, its feet and its shadow show that something isn't quite right when you're looking at it on the tree stump. 
Another uh, example, which we'll see a little bit later, is to ha show how far off it is from the actual floor. Uh, so having visual indicators goes a long way to show, uh, to mitigate these kind of parallax effects. So to summarize our learnings, filter for valid planes. Think about what multi-plane drag and multiple objects uh, if it applies to your use case and what your development costs are. And add context-aware uh, indicator visuals to mitigate parallax effects. And this takes us to AR interactions. So placing objects sounds like, yeah, I'll just place objects. But this, uh, this is actually a pretty complex mechanism. Um, there's a couple ways of selection. Uh, one is dragging from a list, like AR stickers does. Or you tap on a button, and it places an object in front of you. There are several consequences to the choice you make. For example, if you drag and drop, this hides a large part of the screen underneath your finger. And it might be difficult to place things on the, in the world or to place things where you want them to go. Um, on the other hand, when you tap, you need to show a target visual to tell people where they're going to place. This means that you can only aim like a bullseye with your center of your phone and say, look, I know you're going to place something here. One complication with tapping is that you don't know ahead of time what asset the, the user is going to select. This means that you cannot put a sized footprint to show them how big their, to show them a preview of what their object will look like in the world. Whereas that is something that you can do with drag and drop. So um, this is, so if you're choosing how to select assets, this is, again, it depends on um, the aesthetics of your app and what your use case will be. And do you allow placing of only one asset or many at a time? This sounds simple, but again, it is actually a complex issue. If you have many assets, should they collide? What about their physics? Should you place objects on top of one another? Do you, should they fall and tumble realistically? What if you try to drag an object from the floor to the top of another object? What if the user wants to find an already placed object? So these, there are no um, concrete answers to these questions. Uh, I did see, once I saw a really cool app that was for furniture shopping, but you would place objects on top of each other, you could put a hurricane in it, you could have a laser gun and shoot things around. But um, it, it was a lot of fun, but it wasn't appropriate for furniture shopping. <laughs> so again, it depends. Um, for a fun app like AR Stickers, uh, I think right now they ca you cannot place an asset on top of another one. You can elevate them, but they're not actually placed on top of each other. Um, but they collide realistically like when they're beside each other. So that is one reasonable choice that uh, you could make. Um, manipulation. Dragging, rotating, scaling, and elevation. So. In here, you can see that we can scale objects, uh, we can elevate them, but there are cases when this is something you want to restrict and you don't want to let the users scale. For example, furniture shopping or an art installation. You want to preserve the exact size of the object. Um, if a user was shopping for a couch and they scaled it up or they scaled it down, that is not a realistic representation of whether the couch fits in their space, or what they will get in the mail. Uh, not, not in the mail, but what, what they get from Ikea. Um, but then the complexity with this allowing scaling is that you want to communicate somehow when, the, when they try to scale that we intentionally do not want you to scale because this is a true to life representation. Uh, some approaches we could take is to show a bounding box or to show dimensions of like this is x meters by y meters um, or to just, I don't know, flash red and have sirens. It's really up to you. 
um, find user actions that make sense. So there are a few ways you could think of for rotating assets. You could have two fingers where you spin them around, or you could have one finger where you swipe it in a circle. But consider that the latter, when you spin it around with one finger, that could be confusing with moving objects and dragging them around in scenes. So um, pick things that will feel intuitive to the user uh, and reuse existing interactions so that you can take advantage of existing user education. And for elevation, um, you may want to allow users to elevate objects. Again, like, much like our installation and furniture shopping use cases, it depends. Uh, but if you do allow elevation, you may want to show that it's actually up off the floor and not far away, um, not dragged far away onto the plane. So here, you can imagine that without that visual, to in that vertical visual, people would think that it's actually further back on the floor instead of straight up from where it is. Uh, and finally, for this section, um, planes and oriented points are all good surfaces for placement. But do you really want to allow peop people to place objects on both planes and oriented points? What about dragging between them? How does the user know what they're placing on? Imagine if a user placed an object on an oriented point that was at a slope, and they tried to drag it around. This wouldn't work so well, as well as it does for planes. You could have um, like a, fake horizontal, uh, a fake sloped plane and have them drag it around on that. But it, would, it might be confusing. So one way you could approach this is have a different kind of visual per placement type or maybe disallow placing on oriented points at all. Or you could allow placement on oriented points only for a particular kind of asset. For example, you could let people put um, little figurines on oriented points, but not larger objects like houses, and allow those to be placed only on planes. So to summarize our learnings. Asset selection and placement mechanisms really depend on your use case and the aesthetics you're going after. The same applies to object orient manipulation and uh, handle planes and oriented point placement uh, distinctly with the appropriate visual indicators. Uh, UI blindness. Okay. So we've done some user studies uh, on our prototypes, and what we found is that users get uh, blind to 2D UI when they are in AR. One possible reason is because their focus is past the camera and into the real world. So, uh, so they look past um, a lot of the 2D controls. For example, compare the AR stickers 2D UI to the Android camera 2D UI on the far right. There are a lot of controls there on, on the camera UI that are missing and that you would miss anyway in the AR stickers app, such as um, the hamburger menu icon, HDR, um, flash. Not that these controls wouldn't be great, but we would need to message them in a different way. One example of how we are blind right now is can somebody help me pick out a 2D, uh, not, not the assets, but a, um, a icon on the AR stickers app that is more geared toward a utility function? The hint is it's not in the bottom, it's not the shutter button, and it's not one of the asset buttons. Yes, good, good. Yes, the garbage can. I missed seeing the garbage can and it's, it's very easy to miss. Uh, it's a 2D UI. It should be, you would think that, oh, it's a garbage can right in front of you. But no, it's, this is one of the things that can uh, be missed with UI blindness. Um, so one approach you can take is change your 2D UI design approaches. Everything should be absolutely critical to the AR experience. No just-in-case buttons. 
um, and have collapsible UI components. So this asset menu at the top for air stickers, that can go away with a swipe uh, and it can come back to maximize screen space. And many users really like using Portrait because they're so engaged and so invested in the experience. They just want more of that freshest screen space. So uh, having landscape mode is very, very important to AR experiences. Uh, and adjust your UI accordingly. It's not shown here, but it is OK to disable some uh, key UI function, 2D UI functionality in favor of screen space when you're in landscape mode. So to summarize our learnings, adjust 2D UI design approaches and be super minimal. Use only things that are critical to your AR experience. And maximize screen space in landscape. Just really, really go for that precious screen space real estate. OK. And finally, uh, the thing that makes or breaks our app is performance. Um, one ch challenge you may run into is, over time, you see a general slowdown without a clear cause. Um, you go through your app, you try to refactor things, but there is very little gain. One, some ways you can combat this is look at memory management. Um, random memory access patterns or cache misses or fragmentation leads to this general slowdown. Um, Consider data-oriented programming as opposed to object-oriented programming. Favor composition over inheritance. Um, I'm not going to go way deep into details with data-oriented programming. Unity has a really great talk coming up on Friday. You may want to attend that one. Um, briefly, here's a, one example of object-oriented programming versus data-oriented programming. In object-oriented programming, you would focus on the procedural calls. For example, if you had a bunch of AR objects, each object is a mono behavior. Um, you create a new instance when you place it, and then on update for each of these objects, check if the user is near me and place some kind of an animation if they are. In data-oriented programming, your focus is on the data that drives the app, their type, their memory layout, how they are used. So this, right off the bat, enables object pooling and um, efficient reuse. So in our bunch of AR object example, with data-oriented programming, we would have an AR object manager. You have an object pool with uh, a max number of objects you could allocate. And on the object manager's update method, you check if each of these objects uh, should play the animation. So instead of having for each object go into update and do this thing, you have uh, in this one model behavior of the object manager, do this thing for all of my objects. Um, some really great side effects is that you minimize the number of model behaviors and per frame methods. See, take a look at the 10,000 updates Unity blog post, which goes into some details and numbers on the, the huge difference that it makes by eliminating update calls from your game. And profile constantly. You never know when uh, any change, like a, a big feature change or a bug fix, could introduce additional memory footprint into your app. So profile, uh, do a lot of profiling. Profile uh, on every milestone. Use the Unity profiler tools. Uh, they go a really long way in helping you figure out what is uh, leaking memory. You may notice that performance decreases as objects are added. This is partly because anchors are quite costly. So be very cost efficient with your anchors. Um, consider limiting the number of objects you can place in the scene. When you move an object, destroy the old anchor. You can do this now with AirCore 1.0, which you couldn't before. You can destroy anchors. So destroy your old anchor and create a new one where the object has been moved to. If you have uh, an object that moves around constantly, uh, one, one great example someone brought up to me today was uh, having a fish swimming around. Consider having the, an anchor around a central point of where the object is moving and just keeping that one anchor. And when you delete objects, 
always delete your old anchors. Um, something, this goes a little back into user interaction. Something you need to consider is that users can lose or forget objects they have placed. So um, think about cleaning up or detecting when those objects have been lost and are floating around uselessly in your scene and, and cleaning them up. Okay, this is uh, a huge one, scene changes. So it depends on what kind of a phone you have, like a Pixel versus Pixel 2, or Android N versus Android O. But scene changes can take a while. So if I have two AR core scenes and I switch between them, that's easily five seconds lost in the transition. That is huge. So um, when, also consider that when AR core restarts its connection, stale state might stick around. So what you want to do is reduce your scene changes and um, costume them. So uh, for example, in my, if I had two AR core scenes, um, just get rid of that scene change entirely. Put them all into the same scene, have state-specific prefabs, and just switch between those prefabs. Make on enable and on disable your friends. Uh, start is only called once, and destroy, uh, on destroy may not ever be called. It's not guaranteed. Um, group your AR core and your 2D scenes uh, together. Group them in this, into the same uh, flow so that people don't have to go between 2D and AR core too many times. That being said, um, you can consider having a 2D landing page before the AR scene starts up. What this does is when someone goes into the 2D scene, you can actually secretly start up the AR core uh, connection behind and have it try, like actually, it will actually be doing plane detection so that when people switch from the landing page to AR core, voila, the transition is super quick or it appears to be super quick. Um, one risk of this last approach is that if the user is covering the lens, you might have garbage data, but you still earn a lot in um, reducing startup time. And uh, getting a snappy 2D UI. Should you go native or Unity? Um, I've done both. They're both feasible. They both look slick. Um, in tabletop, what we did was we actually had the uh, AR core experiences all done in Unity. And then we had a really clean interface that went into Java, and all of the 2D UI was implemented in Java. This works. This is snappy. But there are some drawbacks, uh, one of which being uh, you need to uh, have, well, you need to have a very crisply defined interface with Java. And if you're more comfortable with Unity canvases and that layout, uh, you probably want to stick to Unity. It's not really, the Android way of building UI is very, very, very similar to how Unity works, just uh, in a different language. But it's totally the same paradigm. Um, with uh, canvases and the layout groups, you can achieve the same material UI look as Android. Uh, it uses the same principles. The drawback with using Unity components is that you have to be very uh, conscious to use, the, again, data-oriented programming. Um, and whereas with Java, you can be a little more lax with your um, memory management and stuff because it's, it's native and it, uh, yeah, you don't, it doesn't take exactly the same memory footprint as Unity 2D UI. So it really depends uh, on your, the skill sets you have at hand, and it depends on your end goal, whether you want to go native or Unity for your 2D UI. Um, my personal feel, opinion is that they're both, they both have, have strengths, and you can achieve the same end goal with either Android or Unity or iOS. So to summarize our learnings, always be profiling. Uh, use general engineering best practices and consider data-oriented programming to maximize performance. Clean up your anchors. Oops. Clean up your anchors. Reduce your scene changes or consolidate them or costume them. And pick whatever 2D UI approach you're familiar with. Uh, just be careful, again, to uh, be conscious of performance and keep profiling. What's next? Okay, so today we've covered a lot of ground. 
We've seen how seemingly simple concepts like surface detection, planes, and object interaction are actually much more complex in practice. We've explored some challenges that we've come across and some ways we can address them. I hope that today's tour gave you an insight into topics to consider for your next AR Core app. But what I really hope to see is not only what awesome AR experiences you can come up with, but also what other challenges and solutions you will find in your journey. We are just getting started with AR Core development, and I can't wait to see what we can all build together. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, uh, when, you, when you said that you were doing some of your UI in the Java end as opposed to in Unity, mm -hmm. did you get accurate profiling out of Unity while you were doing that, or did you do that in a different, you know, an Android studio or something? Uh, yes. So this goes into, you know how Unity has the in-editor profiling versus the on-device? Um, I think we didn't do uh, comprehensive profiling of both UI and the AR core experience. We did mostly, we mostly focused on the AR core experience. Um, but when we did both, it didn't, I recall now that it didn't have much difference. Like take, ripping away the UI and leaving it in didn't really have much impact on the overall app. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Um, that was a great talk. Thank you very much. Lots of information. Struggling to catch up here, digging out. <laughs> Thank um, you. You mentioned that uh, to know if a plane is valid, there were like four things that it's subsume, subsume is different than null, subsume by is null, vertex count is different than zero, and something else is different than zero. Can okay. You? So um, subsume by is null. Yeah. Um, the number of vertices on the boundary polygon is not zero. And extent x and extent z are both also not zero. So extent x and z, um, if you think of your coordinate systems as z pointing for, well, in OpenGL, okay, in OpenGL's uh, negative z, z pointing this way, y this way, and x this way, then you have your horizontal plane like this. So your x extent this way and your z extent this way are both not zero. Okay, and, and you need to check all those to know if a plane is valid, like one of them, for example, if, oh, because each one tells you, like they can die in different forms, so I guess, okay, sorry. So I was just it's, no, it's, you need to check all of them or you can just it, get by by checking this one. It's a good question. Um, I, we, at least we found that the subsumed by and the number of vertices like you can have one without the other. You can have something that's not subsumed by, but has zero vertices. So that's invalid. Um, as for vertices and extent x and z, I, don't, I haven't come across a case where one is zero and the other is not. But uh, if you, like you can, it's possible that you can get away with just checking one. So it's really up to you. Thanks. And just a quick follow-up question. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned uh, like, uh, you sang the praises of data oriented programming for performance reasons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I've actually done similar, and I, it seems that um, when you do object oriented, it's much easier to end up with a Unity project that non-coders can manipulate and touch because there's like each object has its own set of properties and behavior mm -hmm. and such. Um, so do you have to kind of like pick and choose which areas to make that trade off on? Or is there a way to do data uh, oriented programming but still don't lose the like access to non-programmers to the project. Um, that's a great that's a great perspective. Uh, I think you can either pick and choose which areas to make data oriented and which not. However, as like just a gut feeling is, as that sprawl of the object oriented takes over, sometimes it might be difficult later on to refactor everything to make it more efficient. Um, this also goes back into it goes it goes into a slightly a tangent of asset pipeline. Like, how do you make sure that you can still work with your artists? Should you uh, maybe have a debug scene with an object-oriented throwaway script that they can iterate on, and then later you port this whole thing and make it data-oriented? So several different uh, development approaches you can take. Thank you. Yeah.
Cool. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and I hope you enjoyed my talk.